MA from the University of Aarhus in 2001 and his PhD from the University of London in 2009 on a thesis about the SEA shipsheds partly based on his own fieldwork. Already as a student, Björn Louvain had become director of the SEA Harbor project in 2001, a project that ran until 2012. The results of the SEA Harbor project is published, uh, are published, sorry, in the Danish Institute monograph series. We place them here on the piano. It's in volume 15, including a double volume on the Sea ship ships and slipways by Louvain and Louvain and Mette Schaltemose, a volume by Louvain and Janis Sapuntis on the Sea Harbor, the Group 1 and 2 ship ships and slipways. And Björn Louvain is currently finishing a double volume on the harbor fortifications of the Monikia and the Cantharos harbors, which we hope will be out by the end of this year and which I'm sure you will hear more about tonight. In 2013, Björn Louvain became co-director of the Lehrian Harbor Project, the Greek-Danish archaeological investigations at the ancient harbor of Corinth. The publications of the results of the Lechain Harbor project is just getting started and they will also appear in the Institute Monograph series. Björn Lovain has lectured often and widely about the SEA and the Lechain Harbor projects. He has contributed to several exhibitions as well as influential documentaries in Danish, Greek and international documentaries on the topic. In 2016-17, he received the Archaeological Institute of America's Samuel H. Cress Lectureship in Ancient Art. Please join me in a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Christina. Dear friends and colleagues, good evening. Dr. Christina Winter Jacobsen, you are by far the best director we have had here at the Danish Institute at Athens. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation to lecture here tonight. Thanking all the people and institutions who have contributed to the success of the Sea Harbor project would make for a very long evening. Instead, I would like to single out the following people and institutions. I wish to thank the effort of underwater antiquities, especially former Air Force Dr. Hachidaki, Dr. Della Porta, and Dr. Simusi, the present director Dr. Kalamara, and our supervisor Dr. Gurgmelis. I also wish to thank Dr. Steinhauer, former di director of the effort of the Piraeus and the Islands, and the present director Dr. Stella Krusulaki. Mr. Anisos, sorry I pronounced that wrong, Aninos and LMP have provided invaluable help providing me with important photographic data. This will be quite clear in, uh, during the lecture. Finally, I wish to thank the Carlsberg Foundation for generously financing our fieldwork and research over 17 years. I dedicate this lecture to Charles Pochin, who passed away recently. Friend, mentor, fellow adventurer, and mainstay of the Sea Harbor project. Archaeology is a team sport, and I'm proud to say that the Sea Harbor project has an extremely experienced professional staff. The project could not have achieved these results without them, and I'm very happy to see that. There are several team members here tonight. The focus of tonight's lecture is our greatest catch found in the naval base of Munichia, modern Mikrolimanon. 
in this slide, slide we see in this, sorry, in this area we discovered Shipjet 1 or Shipjet Alpha, as I'm tempted to call it, constructed as a part of the Timus Duclean building program initiated 493-92 BC. But a lot more about that later. An old fisherman named Mitsakos guided the Sea Harbor project in 2010 to its most important discovery, the earliest ship yet found in the Piraeus, dated to Terminus Postquim, 500 to 480 BC. As a child, he would fish while sitting on an ancient column that rose out of the sea on the northern side of Mikulimanu. once part of Athens' ancient naval base of Municha. When project members had previously investigated this area, they found only a few dislocated ancient blocks. The underwater environment of Microlimano is a maze of anchors, mooring chains and modern debris. On most days, underwater visibility is only an arm's length. During the first dive in, this, in the area that Mitsakos had pointed out, senior staff archaeologist Panayotis Athanasopoulos and Vasilis Tiaris found the remains of a colonnade and a monumental side wall. Here we see uh, the column, column base, and here we see the side wall. These photos, it's worth pointing out, were taken three days before Sea Harbor Project field work ceased for the last season during this project phase in November 2012. One of those days extremely rare in seven excava excavation campaigns in Munichia Harbor when visibility was good. But first I wish to introduce you to the shipsheds at the warships they housed, the most effective warship known in ancient times, the free banked oared ship known as the Trireme. My fingers are a little too big for this one. Here we go. This is the Olympias reconstruction and she is still an active warship in the Hellenic Navy. <laughs> The Trivrima was about 40 meters long, had a crew of 200 men, and its primary weapon was a bronze ram used for ramming enemy ships. Since we never found an actual Trivrima, it is the holy grail of underwater archaeology. Here we see a Trivrima. Why is it not moving? <coughs> Moving just before. Trying to click on the arrow there. Yeah, it does not. It is. Well, nothing to do about that. I will load the lecture if the next movies are not working. So basically, uh, I'll use this slide to introduce you to what uh, a, a ship shed is. It is basically a slipway area with a ramp that had the transverse timbers that accommodated the keel of the ship. Then it had two side passages on each side of the ramp. 
that they accommodated the people who worked in the shipsheds. And we know from a literary source of the 5th century BC that it took 140 men to take a trirema out of the sea and 120 to put it into the sea again, simply because you cannot let the ship ride into the sea because then when uh, the stern becomes buoyant, oh, yeah, I mean, I mean the, the bow becomes buoyant, the pressure on the key will be too big. And we had uh, uh, a strong superstructure that protected from rain, but also from sun. And this created a perfect environment for the trirema to be maintained. But triremas were mostly placed in shipsheds because uh, of Toledo Navalis, the terrible shipworm that can eat a wooden hull in a matter of months. Here we have her. Let's see. Primary weapon, the ram, a little like bomber cars, just with a little more overall uh, strategies. Oops. Also from a literary source in the 5th century BC, we hear that a one, and one Athenian a comedian, we don't know who it is, he describes the architectural glories of the Acropolis, that they still get in second place to Athens' naval bases in the Piraeus, according to an unknown Athenian writer who wrote, O oh, queen of all cities, how fair your naval base, how fair your Parthenon, how fair your Piraeus. So there you have it the Parthenon sandwich between the naval bases and the harbors of the Piraeus. I obviously like this guy. <laughs> I had promised to touch on the harbor fortifications and I'd really look forward to uh, show some images that uh, Dr. Kemp has given me, but that has to wait until the fall. There's some amazing images of Dutchville with the camera obscura and Basically, it's a whole, I mean, when I put the lecture together, I found out that focusing on, uh, on the harbor fortification is a whole lecture in itself, if not two. So, see you in the fall. <laughs> so here we have it, Shipshed Alpha. It doesn't look like much, but it's quite monumental. The column basis is quite, uh, like this column position here is uh, 1 meter and 60 by 1 meter and 40. And this is the same of, uh, of this side wall that we have here. There's a slight possibility that this is in fact a style of bait, but that's a long, long discussion. So we have a well-defined column position here, here, and here. This block also belongs to this column position here, and I will return to that later. It is narrower than the shipsheds that we have from the, late, from the late 5th century BC and from the 4th century BC. These shipsheds are around 6 meters and 50 in interaction distance, that is from the center of the wall to the center of the, the column base. These are, are narrow. The shipshed Alpha has an interaction spacing of 6 meter and 18 to 6 meter and 20, calculated by our architect by taking a number of points along the best preserved edges and then using linear, linear regression to get the actual direction of the structural direction of the, of the ship jets. Then you make a median between those two lines and you mesh between them and you have the interaction spacing. So here we have how the shipsheds are situated in, in the harbor. We have shipshed Alpha here, also called shipshed 1. We have shipshed 2. And then we have shipshed 3. And then we jump over here and we have shipshed 5, 6 and 7. I mean, I should say that we have only done, I mean, we did a preliminary survey in this area here. But given, given the, the visibility underwater, there could easily be much more in this area here. 
and there's definitely a lot more in the sediments because we have only focused on this, the lower part of Shipjet 1. I have to restart. See if it's happy now. Now it's happy. <laughs> there we have the entrance tower of, uh, to the harbor, one side of the harbor for locations. Under here we have found uh, parts of the harbor for locations that ran into this area here. It is dated to the second half of the, of the 5th century BC. Very convenient with with the Timista, not sorry, Tidilius' uh, description of uh, the Greeks building harbor fortifications at that time in 429 28. So here we have the area where we found the shipjets. The shipjet one is in this area here, and we have them all the way over here to this part here, where we have the last colonnade dividing shipjet six and seven. Look at this house. This is Akti Kumunduru 4. It's very important because it's a topographical key point in our research. You can see there's still bedrock around, and once there was bedrock in this whole area here, they removed this whole part of the Castella here. You should also look at this little house squeezed in between modern buildings. It's uh, Akti Kumunduru 7. And it is, uh, it is built after 1912. Uh, I'm still, this is definitely built in the 1920s, but we don't know exactly when. So, I'm going to show you how we are excavating. Just to give you an idea of the environment that we're working in. So, we have the divers and the tenders arriving to the platform. We have a person who's taking care of the water pump that is driving our excavation equipment, the underwater dredge. It's basically a vacuum cleaner. You'll see it in a second. See Yanni Sabundis getting geared up. We dive in, in, uh, in chemical resistant suits that are made of vulcanized rubber and uh, we also use full face masks. The perfect environment for the coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here we have uh, Sabadis hooking up the, the communication. Because we have very bad visibility, uh, the divers can communicate with each other. They do the comms check here and this safety line goes up to the tenders on the boat who are also in communication with the divers. Here, I think it's Vasilis is getting the dredge ready and positioning it. It's quite, uh, it's a little harder to work with than a travel on land and it actually, it's good physical exercise. So he's put on the extension which is used when we're doing detailed excavation work. And here we see cycle one. And as you can see, this is normal working visibility. We can just see the hands of, uh, <coughs> of Vasilis excavating in the foundations of uh, Shipjet Alpha. He obviously wants the video of a photographer to go away, so not disturb his work, and here's excavating a piece of wood that I'll return to later in the lecture. So when I save the lecture, if, uh, if uh, there's a problem between my computer and, um, and the projector, I think it's, it's my mistake. 
but the planes they are breaking up even though they're JPEG, so I apologize for that. But we are now there, we're now turning to uh, to the chronology of these uh, these buildings. In here, this one is happy. We like to combine a digital survey with uh, with hand drawings. So here you have the digital survey. We have the end of South World One, and we have the colonnade dividing shipshed one and two. And we opened the trench a little away from the column base, so we didn't undermine it. And we excavated into uh, into trench one. And I checked the report. We used 42 hours to excavate a layer that was 44 to 47 centimeters thick. That is careful excavation, but as you'll see, this was also, a, we, we, we already knew that because of the size of the foundations, there was a good chance that these ships yet could be early. So we didn't want to destroy any context. So we excavated happily down into the foundation. Ooh, a nice diagnostic shirt. And here we have it in situ. A nice lekkerne, and here we see it, and I'm also very happy that Anne Houghton is here today, who has drawn these, uh, these finds. And as you can see, this, it's actually three shirts from the same vessel, dates this part of the foundations to Tannus and 520 to 480. Funny enough, the best, uh, <laughs> the best parallel is, uh, is this one at the Agora, courtesy of Craig Mouse, who has, uh, has taken it. And it's actually an Austria car for Mr. Glass. <laughs> so, so <laughs> yeah, that, that's, I find that. Good. Then we also excavated a trench in 2011 in this area, and that also produced some very exciting finds. Also, note that we took. Uh, we took a call in this area here to get a geological understanding of the foundations of, of this ship yet. So I'll just go back. So here we have the foundations. They, they are dated to 520 to 480. The fill between these two column bases were also in, in situ and intact. And in that we found this very interesting piece of wood that could either be from a ship yet, maybe from a trireme, we'll never know. But it's very important because it, uh, the C14 date gives a terminus postquem. The latest C14 date that this can be is 522. So in line with the other ceramics. In, we also found this lecker in uh, in uh, in the ramp foundations, and that is dated again to 520 and 480. It's quite a wide date range, but that's the nature of these vessels. Again, Shipshed Alpha is very unhappy that it's pixelated, but I didn't actually didn't have time, but we took we excavated a long trench in the middle of the ramp to see uh, if we could find the ramp structure. And here we have the section through uh, that we excavated down. <coughs> so basically, we have layer one, which is, yeah, I'll just give you some pointers. This is the colonnade. And to show you where we are in, in the ramp area, so we excavated down through layer one, which is a disturbed layer. Then we came to layer 2A, which was still. Parts of it was disturbed, parts had um, had areas that seemed to be in situ. But it's the nature of the surf zone, that especially when people are dragging anchors through context, the surface is often dead, and we have intrusion that can go down 10, 20 centimeters. So layer three is uh, the rubble foundation, which is a fully uh, sterile ancient layer. It's the rubble foundations of the ramp. And it is placed on Ma, which is layer 4. It's a clay layer, the substratum of the harbor. 
and the surface is actually worked to a gradient of around 1 to 15. And we've also seen that in SEA that they are actually, uh, they're actually using the MAL layer to dig out the uh, foundations. You can read more about that in volume 2. But again, look here. We have the two most important diagnostic finds, the catalog number 11, which was here, and catalog number 19, which is here. Then here is the core that our French colleagues took under Jean-Philippe Royan, who directs the French uh, geological team. He works everywhere, Portus, Alexandria, Piraeus, Lake Island, all the big ancient harbors. So again, we have the top layer, we have the foundation layer, and then we have a layer of pebbles, which we also found in, uh, when we excavated the, um, the, the trench that I showed you before. Just before the end of the trench, there was a thin layer of pe pebbles, which could be the ancient beach. And uh, we also found it here, and then they continued the drill one meter down into the mound to make absolutely sure that it was natural, and it is natural. But again, look at the two finds. We're very close to miss them. Here we have a, a Lekane base, again, with a broad uh, date of 522-480. But then we have this cup skiffers, which is dated to 508-480, and it's only made there. And we actually did not uh, identify this find. This was. Uh, was identified by Dr. Kathleen Lynch, who has evaluated all the data, and I'll return to that now. So the ceramic study presented here was conducted by Yanis Sabundis, and since so much rely on the dates of these finds, we asked uh, Dr. Dr. Kathleen Lynch to evaluate the data, and I quote, Catalogue numbers 19, 25, 26 and 27 are Lekanai utility vessels that do not have a pronounced chronological development and do not offer tight dates. None of these fragments bear features that would place them after the Persian destruction deposits found on the Athenian Agora that is post 480 BC. The problem is that it's hard to give them a start date. All would be happy around 500 BC, as long as we imagine that there is 10 to 20 years probability, either before or after. They all fit with the carbon-14 date, as they are post-522 BC. None are significantly earlier. Ida Egyptian Alpha Terminus Post Quem, 500 to 480 BC, as it would have been completed, as it could have been completed in the early 470 BC after the Battle of Salamis and Plataea. This is the earliest datable evidence of the Athenian naval bases in the Piraeus and I shall return to the significance of this discovery later. I just want to give you some pointers. In 493, that's two, to Mr. Plesma, the great, great idea, idea that instead of, instead of being aristocrats focused on the land, the Athenians should turn their attention to the sea, because that's where the future will be. He actually managed to convince them, and we know that construction, we know from Thucydides that construction of, of uh, the fortifications were begun at this time, but it was stopped uh, when the Persians invaded the first time in, uh, in 490, and then they were pushed into the sea by, uh, mainly by the Athenians at Marathon. Then uh, everything is, is happy. And then in 483, 82, we know the famous silver find in Lafrion. Timisticus managed to convince the Athenians to invest this uh, silver find in either 100 or 200 triremes, which would really prove to be 
enormously important because the Athenians are they are bringing 200 warships or just under 200 warships to the Battle of, of Salamis and the whole Allied fleet is uh, 378 triremes and that is, I mean, that is around 80,000 men at sea the Persians, they come, the many discussions on how many Persian warships there are but I'd say, I sort of, I sort of I put it in the middle where Morrison say at around 1,000, so that's 200,000 persons at sea. So the Battle of Salamis, which we celebrate the 2,500 anniversary, this year is really a major sea battle, and I'll return to that later. So there could there could have been building ships in in this area here. They, they could either be gun construction here. And that also fits with our uh, with our surrounding days. They could have begun here, or they could have begun after the Battle of, of Salamis and um, and Patay in the early 1470s. I don't think we'll ever know, but I, for me, this is this is good enough. But I also want to introduce you the, to the topography of this, this uh, unique building since it's, since it's important for understanding its architecture and position on the shoreline. This photograph taken by the Roman Dis brothers in 1885 sets the scene perfectly for understanding the topography of Shipshed Alpha and for the other six shipsheds in Group 1 at Munichia. The foot of the steep limestone slopes of Monichia Hill, modern Castella, evidently extends down almost to the 1885 shoreline and a very distinct monumental structure run parallel to the shoreline at the foot of the hill. It's this structure here. This is a teaser for the, for the fortified mode. See here it's nicely cut or carved out of the, of the bedrock and here it's constructed. Massive structure. This structure is also visible, the wall I showed you first, in a photograph from the historical archive of the Piraeus taken around 1885 to 1890. In this image we clearly we in this image, we're clearly dealing with a monumental wall. It's easier when you can zoom in, you can actually see the, the actual blocks in it. It's a little, little hard at this resolution. It will be very, I'll print this photo in A3 in the final publication, so it will be very evident. Earlier, in A1810, so the earlier hill in 1810 also depicted the steepness of the hill and how close to the sea the foot of it was situated on the northern side of the harbour. And he actually, Gell actually drew the correct number of courses in the tower, which I think is very avant-garde. <laughs> and we also see it in another pencil drawing of Gell where it's running down. And here again are uh, the remains of the fortified moats, which I'll talk about this fall. And the tower again has the correct number of courses. <laughs> I'll go back to this, this one now. I'd like to stay here. Earlier in 1872, Bernard Gaza also observed parts of this wall on the beach in the northern side of Munichia. Protruding out of the sands of this beach on the northern side of the nearly circular basin here and there parts of the ancient Polygonal Wall, that's what he calls the back wall of the ship ship at sea. Here it's, it's probably not the back wall of the ship ship, <coughs> I'll return to that. And especially often the headers or other blocks of walls, Wange, which continue underwater and out from the height 
where the eye was not blinded by the sun's reflection, were clearly recognizable in the clear shell of the waters for a length of about 60 feet, that's 20 meters. This plane is unfortunately also broken up a bit, so about that. The second wall in particular, which because it lies under water, was not easy to measure directly, stretches fairly close to the North Mole and were almost completely parallel to it. We accordingly measured it in such a way that I, standing on the, on the height, kept that point on the goal in view, which projected the same distance <coughs> as the furthest end, end of the wall, Wangen, in the water, and that Dalman, his companion, as he had proposed, in the meantime, held the yardstick himself on the goal, whereby 100 feet resulted. So, this is, this is difficult German and it's translated by Stephanie Kemmel. But what it shows is that Gaza is, is recording a wall that is four, more than 45 meters long. It runs parallel to the road and it's built on an inclination, which is a pretty good case that it's a, it's a ship ship. So this wall is coming in in this area here and then Glasser, he walks from this wall, he walks about 47 feet and is standing in this area here and here he says he finds another structure which is probably this structure here we will never know but they wander along the beach, beach line which at this time was further in and they actually don't see anything in this area. It's only when they reach the next group of ship ships that, uh, that, uh, that they begin to record the uh, antiquities again. So basically, you, the mole is coming in here, connecting to the now gone uh, Castella Hill, making a perfect uh, a perfect protection for the naval base in this area here. Good. The topography of the shoreline area on the northern side of Nicolimino has changed dramatically since 1885 to 1890. The narrow, narrow dirt track on the previous slide widened into a dirt road flanked by four houses from the 1920s. Two of them are still standing today. It's this house here and this little house here. The facade of this house is 9.6 meters and this, this here is 5.9 meters to give you an idea. And here we see the northern side of Munich in 1936. Between 1936 and 3rd of February 1944, the shoreline area was extended into the sea for a distance of around 20 to 24 meters from the facades of Arctic and Rule 4 and 7. You can see this area here is, is wide and we have new structures here. You can just make out Arctic Commune 4 here and, uh, and Arctic Commune 7 here. By 12 March 1953, the shoreline in front of Arctic Commune 4 and 7 had been transformed into a hard surface harbor front and the area to its west would soon receive the same treatment. It's this little part here. And this is how it looks today. Again, Akti Mutsukuru, Akti Kununuru, Four, and Seven. So, this is, uh, this is how the ships are situated today. We have 
Egyptian monk, Alpha here. It goes to a depth of 1 meter and 93 on these two columns. On this column, the is here. We have followed it for 33.61 meters onto this point, where it disappears under, under the harbor front that has actually been built into the sea. So this is this is the first. Uh, we're still working with, working with the photogrammetry of uh, of placing to figure out how uh, how wide this dirt road is in uh, first in the in the twenties. This is from the nineteen twenties, where we estimate it's around ten meters. And here it has been widened a little further. And uh, you have to imagine that this house here, this is actually the re re remains at the foot of the Komundu hill that we, have, uh, that we have right here. This has all been removed. So the ship chairs do not extend further than the foot of the Komundu hill from the images that you have seen before the harbour was, uh, was uh, heavily urbanised. I mean, the limestone cliff is simply too steep. And you can see that there's still remains of the... They probably kept this because it's important for keeping the building up. But they have really cut away the whole area here. So the landscape has changed a lot. So this is the preliminary uh, location of the... Of, uh, of the shoreline in the 1920s and 1930s, Article Blu was built into the into the Castella Hill, Bunica Hill, and uh, the wall that we saw would be positioned some meters here, and then they could have filled in to build this uh, to build, to expand the dirt road. So this whole area here is. Uh, is, uh, is covering the shoreline of the 1920s and the shoreline probably ran in oh, some meters further in, in, the, uh, in the 1885. So there's been an enormous transformation of this, this landscape. So we have the lower end of ship jet alpha here. Just going to check the measurements. So it's 48 meters point five to uh, to uh, the estimated uh, 1920 shoreline, and that's that's quite close to. Remember, Bernard Casa is describing a wall that is extending for 45 meters into the sea. So that sort of supposed that support supports this interpretation. How far they extended further in, we don't know. I think that the wall that we saw in the image, that, that is actually a retained wall behind the ship sheds. We also see that at Seir, that there's, a, there's the back wall of the ship sheds, and then there's a road or passageway, not really enough because you have to move a lot of men and equipment to these, uh, these naval bases. So there was probably a passage here between the structure that you see in the photographs and uh, the back wall of the ship ship that uh, is hidden somewhere down here. And if anybody has questions we can return to the to the slide again. We now return to the historical implications of ship ship alpha, the ship ship that is dated to town is post -quim. 500 to 480 BC. Ships at Alpha, seen here in artistic reconstruction by Yanis Nakas, was built in the years of the young Athenian democracy. And I find it breathtaking, a breathtaking thought that one of the triremes that fought against the Persians at Salamis in 480 BC and saved Athens and the rest of Greece from Persian rule was in all probability housed in this building.
Lyndon Johnson said in a very important speech, at times history and fate meet at a single time in a single place to shape a turning point in man's unending search for freedom. This was true for D-Day, June 6, 1944, and I'm showing this slide because these Higgins landing craft, which they built a huge number of, was really instrumental in, uh, in the D-Day landings. They couldn't have done it without, uh, without this uh, very willful out uh, landing craft. So you'd say that there's a, there's a parallel between building the fleet of Triremes after the, the silver found at Lavion and then at the end of the Second World War building a lot of these landing craft to, to free Europe from, uh, from the Nazis. And it's very true for the Battle of Salis, 480 BC. And this year we celebrate the 2,500 year anniversary for this turning point in world history. Keep in mind that all social classes rode and fought from the Triremes in the Battle of Salis. I strongly believe that this pivotal battle created an immense strong bond among most of the citizens. And in this way, the Navy was to develop into the backbone of the Athenian democracy. What we have been excavating in essence are the material, sorry, what we have been excavating in essence are the material remains of that extraordinary historical development. Thank you very much for your attention. Ships, if 
some not so nice people nice. went down the pirates, they came out. So the demons, they earned a lot of money by escorting ships up the coast, for example, along Asia Minor and up through to the Black Sea. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Yes. Well, congratulations for, <coughs> for the project, the, the SEA project uh, uh, in general. I wanted to ask you, um, okay, you gave us uh, a very early date for this uh, ship set. Uh, do you think that uh, it's uh, uh, the earliest one, the, the Munichia uh, ship sheds, uh, have been the earliest ones uh, uh, from all uh, Berlin uh, uh, Piraeus, uh, uh, the earliest from all three harbors of Piraeus? That's a, a very happy that you're asking that question. I'll just go back to you. So basically here we have Katmos, which is the main commercial harbor. It's also a ferry harbor to the islands like it is today. And it also had a naval base that is probably built in the 4th century BC. Sea, we have found ship sheds that are built in the 5th century BC, but we cannot date them any closer than that. Actually, we have a date, we have a date, we have a Tammuz antiquity of 700, oh sorry, 375 to 350. So the, this is this is the Tamil postprint of the phase three. So the phase two they are built before before this date range, and they are probably in all probability fifth century BC. Also because we see a lot of reuse material in them. So as you know, the, as a part of the peace terms at the end of the Peloponnesian War in 404. The Athenians had to tear down all of their, their, their ship sheds and parts of the fortifications, and they were left with, I think, seven, uh, seven triremes, because some of them actually had, now you ask, they actually had a religious and a diplomatic uh, function, a few of the, of the triremes. So I'm glad that I could, <laughs> that I remember that. But Munichia, I mean, basically it's Pausanias that tells us that the, that the Phaeron harbor, which is over here, it's closer to, uh, to Athens than the Piraeus, and it's also closer to what is, I won't go into that discussion, but it's probably closer to the commercial center of early Athens. So uh, it's located here, which is also the theological research by Jean-Philippe Roland, who we are also working with shows that this was a lagoon area in this area here. It was a swamp, so it was not, they had to do a lot of work uh, to, uh, to get the roads and later in the 5th century BC to get the long roads down to the Paris. So the old harbour was here and Parsegna says that this was the naval, this was a naval base of the Athenians. It, it, it's, there could easily be more naval bases. And if you look at it, if Parsegna comes sailing here, there's a, a, a historian has proposed, I won't, uh, you'll have to say it himself, has proposed that maybe Parsegna misunderstood uh, Monica as a, as a part of the Paris. We don't, we don't know what it is at the end of, uh, of the Federal Way. And uh, also when we hear about the Piraeus and the historical sources of the 5th and the 4th century BC, Munichia is often treated separately from, uh, from the rest of the, of the Piraeus. So we don't know, I mean, there's still a, a lot to be done in, in the Piraeus. I mean, we have excavated on the water for 10 years and there's Still have a lot of work to do there for future generations, but I find it very interesting that we, we have this early naval base in Micha. We should also remember that Hippias, in 510, when he becomes really unpopular in Athens, that he escapes down, you know, he does, he, he's thrown out by the Spartans before he manages to do it, but he is actually planning to build a castle on Micha 
and it's an extremely well protected bay. You saw how it is protected on all sides and with the fortified bones and the little acropolis up here, which will play an important role in the theme in history, which I will talk about in more. Mm -hmm. So it's really it's only the center, Monique and I. I'm still still working, working with the with the with the idea that there is the possibility. I mean, we did, since Marcelli says that, that it was a naval base of the theme that could easily have been more, and we also have to remember that Marcelli has arrived many years after. And he had problems with left and right and things like that, so. I hope that uh, that answered it. But I was also, so, I mean, now that I've always been focused on Seer, because it was the largest naval base, but now I've really fallen in love with the uh, with the Perhaps, uh, if I may, uh, yeah. I'm coming from Piraeus. I'm yeah. a great historian, but yeah. I'm not a Piraeotin. So, um, as far as I know, the municipality of Piraeus uh, has planned a, a, a reform of the entire area. So, there is a hope that uh, through uh, and uh, rescue excavations beneath the modern street, you may have, uh, you may get the, we may get uh, the real uh, length of uh, the installations uh, uh, you started to find. So your work will uh, be something like a compass for the rescue excavations yeah. to be done there. And I will provide all the information on this to the to the efforts and charts. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, because it's fighting the back wall of, uh, of this shipshed is uh, would be really great. Yes? I got another question. Uh, when you speak about the triremes that were built there and stored in the ship sheds, uh, and then at the Battle of Salamis, there were hundreds of these. So did have they and the battery ram is metal as I understand. Yep. Have they found any evidence of these bits and pieces? Because surely some ships were destroyed. Unfortunately, in, in, in Sandwich Bay has not been uh, investigated uh, in, in detail yet. And it's because there's been dumped a lot of, uh, of trenching material there, so the actual battle site is buried deep in the, in the sediment. But, I mean, Hopefully in the future there will be equipment, soft bottom profilers that can go really deep into the sediments. You've got your vacuum cleaner. Yeah, <laughs> I have to vacuum clean quite a, quite a lot of the people are talking about, several meters of sediments. But, uh, but definitely there must be something out in the, in the sediment straight also because we have a direct parallel to, uh, to Italy where they are, where they are investigating the battle of one of the battle sites at the, of the Second Punic War and they're finding a lot of rams there that has probably been twisted off in battle, both Roman and uh, and Phoenicians. Phoenicians. So but they're still not finding ships though, isn't the deal that the ships No, no, are they have uh, they have been rams. they have been very careful at uh, at uh, when they're locating a ram to get a very precise precise uh, reference on it. And then they searched the metal detectors to see if there were fasteners or any metal remains of, of the ship. But the problem is with these, with these, uh, the trireme is basically it's a little of a ship and it's a little of a raft. It's, uh, it's very fast and it has to be very high, it has to have a very little area of wet area as we call it on ship, so it can grow very fast and then you will fast. <laughs> so the problem is that when it gets rammed, it doesn't necessarily sink. It, we often hear that uh, after, after a battle that warships are swarmed, so they're sitting on the surface of the sea, and an important part of the aftermath of the battle is to tow your own damaged ships and also if you can get some of the enemy ships back to your base. And if you cannot do that, you will simply burn them on, uh, on the surface. So a trireme, when it eventually sank, it would sit very high on the seabed and it would be eaten by the evil ship on Telegram Whereas a commercial ship 
when the tank was it was often had a cargo of amphoras that when it sank it would already be pushed into the into the into the seabed and the sedimentation would build up around it. And that's why we find uh, we find uh, often find merchant ships <coughs> because then there's created an, an environment with no uh, oxygen and shipworm doesn't like the oxygen. They don't like fresh water either. And what was the metal that they used? Maybe, maybe bronze. Yeah. Yes, please. And for the piece of wood you found, can you tell what kind of tree it's from? We have not done the wood analysis uh, as, as of now, to be absolutely honest. But I'll have uh, Angel Kisisi, who is our own conservator and wood specialist at Bekayan, do the, do the wood analysis. I have a question. Can we go back to one of the plants where you can see the orientation of the ship ships? Yeah. Because it seems that the orientation is slightly funny in terms of the shore. That's one of the naughty questions, but it's a bit <laughs> Uh, so, you, yeah, 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 so... So, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, what, I mean, this is, this is, uh, the survey team is trained by Richard Anderson, so this is super precise architectural work, even if the plan is a little broken up here on the front of the screen. And uh, the structural orientations of the ship ships, they lie between 0.1 degree to 1.1 degree around the medium, so they have planned them very precisely. But Christina is absolutely right that they have built them on an angle to the to the shoreline, and that is probably because we are still we're still evaluating the bathymetry of the geophysics that we've done here to understand if it's the seabed that uh, that does it. But I what I didn't because I didn't have enough time say is that the, this part here is at a much higher elevation compared to this one so over here. So it also looked like they're candid, that they're building steps along the shoreline. And graphs also say that here in the Kuliman, that they're all pointing towards the harbour mouth and not the, and they're not the built perpendicular to the, to the coast. That's also, I mean, that's obviously why I don't think that this structure is the back wall. Isn't this, this is actually more or less aligned with the harbour mass though, isn't it? Because the harbour mass is... I don't, I don't have the full one uh, no, to show you, unfortunately. No. But the structure that I showed runs in this direction, mm -hmm. which is not obviously not uh, perpendicular to the, to the sutures. So that's also why I believe that it's a retaining wall that one created the... Uh, I mean, you also needed some protection from the Mika Hill when, when things were shifting down the hill. And also because we actually see it in many places that we have an area or passageway we find the ship, ship ships. So there might have been a little area of workshops or something like that that, that didn't require it. So, and we should also think that the Mika Hill, since it is so steep, we could also think if these ship ships needed a back wall at all. I mean, maybe they didn't make the hill provide protection enough. It obviously, if when it rained, they probably <laughs> obviously had to have some kind of draining system to get the water away from, uh, from the situation. Presumably they would also need to communicate between the ship ships, so there must have been some way of going around the back or something. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. because I mean, yeah. imagine they're moving 200 people mm -hmm. into each of these yeah. units, so just in this I mean, we know from 4th century BC source that there was uh, that there was 82 shipshed units in Munichia. There was 196 at Sea and 94 at Kandor. So that's 372 shipsheds times 200 men. So it's a uh, it will require work with maintenance and all that. It's a rather large logistic operation. I mean, just banging these seven. Uh, Seven tribunals would require you to move uh, 1,400 
development into, uh, into this area. So there must have been some logistical uh, yeah. passage either at the end of the sections, which we actually have quite a lot of evidence for, or in front of the on front of the sections, although I don't find a wet, slippery surface uh, that's built on an inclination as the best uh, entry point. Imagine 1,400 people going there and yeah. at least have yeah. some injuries. <laughs> yeah? I have another question. Yeah. Uh, the ship sheds, as I understand it from your lecture, is where you store the ships. Yes. Where are you making them? The, we know that, uh, that ships were, were being constructed in the Canthos Harbour, in a small area that there's a little bit of resource describing that. But most, uh, most warships are believed to have been built, uh, I mean, when the fleet really gets big from the 5th and 4th century BC, that the timbers come in from, um, from the northern Greece and even from the Black Sea area, and there's been proposed, I can't remember who proposed it, but that it would be logical to build these warships at the river mouths where you could transport wood down and then build the ships like uh, in, a, in a decent condition so that you could tow them back to the Piraeus. We have parallels for that in, in Denmark and England that the ships are built near um, forested areas in the 18th century. And it makes a lot of sense because when you're building a ship, you're losing a lot of wood. I mean, when you're making planks and keys and this, it's, it's, it's a lot to transport to Athens and then to lose 40% of the timbers during the ship production. So it makes sense that they were constructed near the forest. At least that's why I believe and then they were turned to, back to the naval bases and then refitted with all the the things that they needed so that they were ready in operation. Thank you very much. I think that unless there are any... Well, well, actually, if you're all brave and you can stand a slightly more intimate environment next door, you know, it's, it's, our reception area is not so large, but uh, we're hoping that no one carries anything nasty with them. <laughs> I hope it will all join us for a glass of wine and the opportunity to ask further questions. But before we do that, I think we should uh, think that we should